Ladies and gentlemen, today is February 23rd, 2017, and this is the King Kale Show, episode 320, I always forget to check the number, 329, easy materials, yes, that is right, today we're going to be learning about materials with none other than Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower, and this is part three of the series, so if you want to go back and see how we got to this point, and a quick little kind of summary of where we have been is last week we were here, and then the week before that we were here, so... It's been a lot of crazy improvement and cleaning up of this piece. But today we're going to be talking about specifically rendering materials and what a daunting subject that is. But I'm going to make it very easy for you guys to remember. I've got some good exercises and we're going to learn together. It's going to be a really nice time. But before we get into today's tutorial, we need to take a stroll down a very special place. And that is, of course, the lovely lane. Also announcing the ability to job post jobs. That's really nice. But journey with me over to Tiny World slash K and Kale Founder. Click on this secret link called See All and then you will be indeed dazzled by the amazing pieces that you guys have been submitting out there. By the way, I do need to tell you guys why I am a little bit late releasing this and that is because I injured myself <laughs> the other day. Uh, I went snowboarding and I totally jacked up my shoulder. So yesterday it was fi literally physically impossible for me to do anything. Uh, but luckily it is kind of coming back a little bit but it hurts really bad to raise my arm past a certain point. So that's why this show is a little bit delayed, but that's okay because today we're going to be jumping back into it as usual. We're going to be having a good time and I'm feeling much better than I was last week. As you can tell, my teeth are glowing, shiny and uh, whatever is happening. I'm wearing my, my workout shirt. I'm feeling strong, feeling buff except for this thing, but that's okay because everything's fine. Everything's fine. And we got some good questions for the catapults today too. All right, but that's enough blabbing. Let's go ahead and get into today's tutorial. We're going to be talking about materials. We are the material gals, and we're going to be talking about putting the materials on this gale. So uh, the first thing that you guys may notice is, hey, well, look at all of the nice little things, little things that we kind of cleaned up and added in there, specifically in this area of like the little brooch and the collar and whatever that thing is hanging down, the tie and the leather. And you might ask, well, Keenan, that, that looks really nice. That looks really nice, but I don't know how to make materials like that. People are always tell me to work on my materials, and I need to learn how to do it better, okay? And by that, uh, before we get into the time lapse, let's just do the exercise. Let's do the exercise, okay? So let's, uh, it's time for exercise. <laughs> let's go ahead and pull up our balls, because <laughs> we, <laughs> you can learn everything. As I said once before, you can learn everything you need to know with balls. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk about materials and how to easily, uh, a common misconception that we run into, right? Because we hear materials and we hear texture, okay? And we hear stuff like matte and gloss and reflectivity and re reflected light and all this stuff that we have to deal with, okay? But I'm gonna break it down into a very, very easy to remember uh, <laughs> equation. I think equation is the word I was looking for there. Yeah, it's a very easy to remember equation. And that is the first thing that you want to do, I'm sure you guys have done this in your classes at school, and that is, okay, well, you want to light the ball. You want to light the ball. So let's say that similar to the piece back here, we have a couple different light sources. Do you know where they are? Well, you should be able to pick them out where they're coming from. We have a very bright, uh, we have a very bright rim light coming from behind Lady Maria, but then the, our main light source, AKA our key light, is coming from the top right. Top right, see? So that's why it's casting this shadow right here, say from the brim of the hat. And then it's kind of lighting this side of the face, but see how there's cast shadows all happening throughout here. And then the left side of Maria is all in shadow, okay? So we're gonna light the balls in a similar way. So let's go ahead and follow that same equation. We're gonna say, okay, so the light is coming from the top. Now, do you notice there's the first thing that I wanna point out is that I am hue shifting, ladies and gentlemen. So in this case, we have purple balls and we are hue shifting towards red. Now this is personal preference, but this is kind of what would happen if you were using a warm light. Now something that I want you guys to avoid doing, uh, the first tip that I want you guys to think about at all times when you begin lighting your materials is what is the color of the light that is interacting with it, okay? Now in this case, because a lot of people tend to say, okay, here is the color of the shadow of my object. Now to make it lighter, well, let's just take this color and let's just bring it up not necessarily all, always what's happening, right? You wanna make sure that you are thinking about hue shifting. 
hue shifting. Like, is it gonna go more red with a warmer light? Or is it a cooler light? And in this case, it would hue shift more towards blue and you would get an effect like this. Ah, isn't that awesome? Not to mention when you start adding these things into your drawings, it starts to like really become much more interesting to look at. Do you see how awesome that is to have that hue shift? Now pay close attention to this. This is your hue Richter scale, okay? So you can grab this with your little eyedropper and kind of drag it back and forth. And you can see how the Richter scale moves from blue to red. Now I always, 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 always think about this stuff. Having huge shifts between your lights and your shadows makes your pictures look much more realistic, much more interesting, and it's very pleasing to the eye, okay? So that's rule number one. Make sure you're hue shifting. Second rule, you want to start thinking about matte, uh, how matte or glossy your surface is, okay? Now this is something completely different from texture, and then, but we'll get into that in just a moment. Or actually, maybe it would be good to go into it right now. Okay, so let's say that we wanted this circle up here to look like leather. Okay, so what would somebody do uh, who may not have this equation in mind? Well, they would say, okay, well, uh, if I look at like, say this leather uh, or this fake leather thing on my, let me go ahead and see if I can switch this over. There you go. So look, okay, well, we have this fake leather texture on this sketchbook right here. And if we look closely at it, well, it looks like just a bunch of little cracks and noise that go through it. Okay, well, knowing that, let's go ahead and just do that. Let's add that texture and that noise into this. And then maybe it'll look like a leather thing. Yeah, maybe just like add this in there and yeah, kind of looks like it. But a lot of people confuse this. They think that this is what rendering materials is. They think about putting texture onto it, but that's not all that it is. In fact, I would argue that this is the very last thing that you want to do. The first thing that a lot of people are forgetting about is how matte or glossy is your surface, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about that first. So to make something appear glossy, do you know what you do? Well, it's, it's this simple. The more glossy an object is, the more the light source is going to appear. The more the light source is going to be reflected back at our eyes. In other words, it's going to become shinier, right? You're gonna have the specular showing more uh, more clearly, okay? And then it can get even hotter, right? We call it getting hotter uh, to get to the point where we actually see the light source itself being reflected, depending on how glossy your object is, okay? So take a look at that, boom. These two compared, do you see how the light kind of like constricts itself to the point where it's more, it's hotter, right? If we wanted to do the same thing with a blue light, obviously here, we're gonna push it more like this, Right, we're gonna constrict the light like that. And then boom, we're eventually gonna to get to something like this. See, now that is how you make something look more glossy. You push things more, uh, you push the highlights more bright, I guess, more, more brighter, <laughs> okay? Now if something is matte, then this specular is going to diffuse. It's not going to show that much. It's going to lightly lay over top of the object in question, okay? So if this object was more matte, it would look something more like this, okay? So see how we're still lighting it, but it's not getting as bright. It's not getting as bright as we have it up here. Now, step two, the reason why. The reason why we're able to see this specular more clearly, or the light source that is hitting this ball, is because it is more reflective. It is more reflective. And what happens with a reflective surface? Well. It's not just the light that we're able to see, we're able to see the rest of the environment around it. So in this case, um, if we're lighting it similar to what's happening in the Lady Maria piece, we have a few different light sources to keep in mind. Now the first one is our backlighting. The very, very bright rim light that's happening. And that's coming from the top right, or actually the, the back right, okay? So you would see something like this. Okay, and it's gonna be very, very bright because it is super reflective. This material is super reflective, so it's gonna be bright as heck. Okay, so make sure, and, and especially the part that's pointing directly at it. That part can get really bright. Here's the second part though. There's also a third, there's a third and final light source that is happening in the piece. Now what is that? Well, let's take a quick look at it. Can you guess what it is? We have the key light and we have the rim light 
But there's, there's a third one. What is it? It's the reflected light coming from the ground. <laughs> and uh, that's a really good way. I get a question a lot of the time is like, how do I light my piece? Well, a really good thing, a good rule to go by is the same rule that photographers use. And that is three-point lighting. And that usually has to do with your key light, right? The thing that's gonna light your character. Rim light, something that's behind it that will help reinforce the silhouette. And reflected light, which is something that just kind of happens naturally. Stuff that's bouncing off the ground. Sunlight hits the ground and it bounces up and it helps to fill in those shadows and maybe add more color to them, uh, depending on what surface they're standing on. Uh, but in this case, it looks like the ground is sort of like this grayish blue. So the light that's gonna be reflected at the bottom is going to be a grayish blue, okay? And because we have a very reflective surface, that color is going to be very, um, it's not going to be very uh, distorted, okay? So it's not gonna be very distorted. So we're gonna have a lot of blue that's happening in here. Now do you notice as I do this, the material itself, or rather, sorry, not the material, but uh, the texture, what's the word? I, I, I struggle to figure out what word I wanted to call this, but I just call it like how shiny it is. The matte or the glossiness of this shape begins to come through, okay? Now, similar to what I talked about with the light source being uh, more apparent, same thing is gonna happen here with the reflectivity. So the more glossy an object is, the more of that light source, AKA the ground is going to show through. So in the end, you might be, you might end up getting something like this, okay? So there you go. There's a good example of something that is very reflective. Now with the same thing, let's go ahead and use a different light source. I understand that this is slightly different, but let's light it in a similar way. So because this is not as reflective, our light source is going to affect the bottom of the ball but it's also gonna get really diffused. It's gonna be more blurry and kind of stretched out over this area. Now, the rim light is the one thing that would probably be very similar. It might darken a little bit, it might darken very slightly, but overall it's gonna be kind of the same thing, generally the same thing. And that's because the, like, the amount of light that is being compressed because it's so, uh, because it's so like, this is a whole nother term that, or like a scientific thing that we have to get into, but the amount of light that's being compressed on that plane by the time your eye sees it, um, the actual material will not matter as much. The only thing, at least that's the way that I understand it. Uh, the only thing that would happen possibly is that it would just be a little bit darker, a little bit darker than something that's glossy. But overall, you're still gonna see that rim light in a similar fashion. It's really apparent in areas where the light is facing directly at you. Okay, so there we go, ladies and gentlemen. There is the way, that is the way that you do glossiness versus matte, okay? Now, the next important thing that we need to talk about is finally texture. Now that you've gotten to this point, now you're ready to start doing some texture. I'm seeing if I can add a little bit more um, hotness to this reflected light to give it more gloss. See, look at that. Look at that, I feel like that's much better. Needs to be a little bit smoother. Needs to be a little bit smoother. There we go. Smoothed and also a little bit brighter. I think that's what I was going for right there. Yes, there we go. Okay, so now that you have, uh, you have determined the glossiness of your material, now you can begin going in there and putting in your texture. Texture. So let's go ahead and begin by doing what we did earlier. And that is putting in texture to make it look like leather or look like metal or any of that stuff, okay? Now you can start thinking about the lines that go through it. You can think about the lines that kind of are apparent in these pieces. And notice how, okay, this is really, really important. This is really, really important. I grabbed the color of the shadow and I'm beginning to push that color into the highlights, okay? Now a really cool way that you can kind of get away with this uh, an easier way to get away with this, to get started, is do like the comic book technique, where you just kind of like add in a little bit of detail in a couple areas. You don't need to go in here, you don't need to zoom in and do every single one of these little tiny things. Uh, but if you wanted to, here's another thing that you can do. Create one area, kind of clean up one area, 
And again, this is really good to like refer to an actual piece that you're trying to mimic. And look very, very closely at what causes it to look that way. What causes it to look like leather, or in this case, fake leather. And you wanna make sure that you stay away from making too many similar shapes, right? Don't do this type of stuff. Don't just start drawing circles like this. You gotta get in there and have large shapes, medium shapes, and small shapes, okay? You can go in there and kind of clean it up. You can use your eraser. Most important part is that you're just kind of getting a design that you like, getting a design. Think of yourself as a designer. You're designing shapes. You're designing a puzzle piece that is going to be used throughout the rest of your drawing. Okay. Now, if you wanted to replicate this, you don't need to draw it across the entire ball. Don't worry. Don't worry because you have the magic of Photoshop in your hands and you can just lasso this and then you can hit control J. Once you've hit a sufficient kind of area that you like, just control J it and kind of copy it. You can shrink it down a little bit. You can kind of deform it. You can right click it, hit warp. You can kind of like stretch it a little bit. And then there hit control E grab that entire thing, duplicate that. Whoops, did I do that right? Grab this entire thing. Wait, why is that? There we go. Grab that entire thing, duplicate that. Oh, look, there you go. So you can begin kind of like patching it in and kind of filling it in as you go so you don't have to draw every single little piece. But me personally, the way that I like to do my textures is more of that comic book style, a little bit more of that comic book treatment where you only put it in a couple set areas and maybe kind of gradate out the rest of it. Um, but today, oh, that actually looks really nice. I like that a lot. Uh, but today, I want to make sure that uh, we have a nice, consistent use of both, okay? So let's continue with this. Why is this looking like doo-doo? I need to get rid of this. Get rid of some of that, too. Let's try this again. Oh, that's why. These, these things were like overlapping. That's why it looked like crap. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and finish this up. Okay? So once you get a design that you guys like, now what I want you guys to do is this. Okay, let's go ahead and... Well, we might as well. Might as well fill in the entire thing. Let's go ahead and fill in the entire thing because I'll show you also how you can simplify it very, very easily very, very easily. So let's go ahead and just merge this entire thing. Does this even need to be clipped? I don't think it does. Yeah, let's just go ahead and fill in this entire thing because we wanna make sure that we're also covering a little bit of that centerpiece, right? A little bit of that centerpiece. So let's go ahead and duplicate that. Let's go ahead and flip this, kinda of stick it there. Looks good, yeah, looks good. And don't worry, it's gonna look a little strange at first. But don't worry, everything is under control because I am a professional. And I always know what I'm doing, okay? <laughs> I never make mistakes. Contrary to popular belief, I never make mistakes, okay? So you're gonna get something that looks like this, okay? And that's a good, that's a good start. You don't need to worry about this stuff up here because the most important part is that we show a gradation, show a gradation that's happening here. Okay, so that's step one. Get your texture in there. Step two, lock it. Lock it with this magical checkerboard thing down here. And now what you're gonna do is you are gonna create a little bit of a gradient. A little bit of a gradient. And here's how you're gonna do it. So I want you to grab a middle color, sort of like this middle color right here, maybe even up here. And then I want you to put that color in the area of the highlight, right? So it's almost like you're lighting your texture lines. You're lighting your texture lines, and this is going to do this type of thing. It's going to create this effect. And then as it gets closer to the shadows, I want you to darken it. Darken it like this. And then as it gets totally in shadow, here's the point, is that you want, by the, by the time it gets to the shadow, you're gonna see less texture because there's less light that's bouncing off of it, okay? So you're gonna end up getting something like this. Can you now begin to see like the texture that's forming, right? We have set up yet, yet how simple it was to set it up because we figured out the glossiness of our piece, of our texture, and then we put the lines on top of it. We put the lines on top of it. So we figured out the material, let's just say it this way. We figured out the material which represents our matte, right? Matte or glossy surface. 
and then we added the texture, which is the lines, the lines that tell us what this shiny or matte texture is. Okay, and then from there, here's the fun part. Here's the funnest part, is that each of these little lines in here has its own little sort of uh, mini, mini lighting thing that you can do with it. It has many things that you need to go in there and now you need to begin refining. Little areas that will pick up light. Little areas that will kind of reflect a little bit of light back towards you. And this is where the real, the real magic begins to show through. This is where it really begins to feel like a true texture. A true texture. Because now you're lighting each of these little cracks in their own way. And this is what takes a long time, guys. <laughs> this is the stuff that would take weeks. But can you see how much simpler it is when you break it down into a couple different steps? As opposed to trying to say, uh, okay, we're trying to, to do this leather piece. And okay, well, let's first start by drawing some cracks. And then at the same time, you're trying to think of how each of those cracks is gonna pick up a little bit of that light. Now this is really, really apparent when it starts getting down here. You see how I can put in like little pieces of light that are getting picked up down here, like where it's moving more into shadow. Look at that people, look at that. And we already have the colors picked out that are gonna work because we already did all the work back here. We know what colors we need to use. The deformations and all the things that are happening within the texture are just replications of what we already figured out. Okay, so think of it as you already figured out the ingredients to your stew, to your amazing stew, and now you are just moving them throughout the rest of the piece to make a perfect, a perfectly flavored stew for your viewers. Okay? <laughs> I love the freaking, uh, the analogies. It's my favorite part. <laughs> So there we go. That is looking awesome. That is looking great. Tons and tons of fun. Now, uh, let's go ahead and take a look back at where we came from. And then we're gonna do a little bit of an exercise on Maria herself. And that is how I am going to finish the piece. Again, you guys can probably guess it's gonna take a while, but I'll show you a couple real world examples of how I did this on Lady Maria. Now again, I did it in a simplified fashion. I wanted to show you guys the like the true like crazy way to go about doing this. And then I wanted you to be able to simplify it from there. Okay? But this is how I like to render my materials. Okay? So look at that. Look at that. Isn't that cool? That's our overpaints. We have our lines there, and then beneath we figured out all the colors and the lighting that we were going to use, and then boom, there you go. Now, oh, one more thing. One more thing, this doesn't only happen at your key light source. Remember, we have two other light sources that have not been accounted for. Now, this is really where your texture is gonna start kind of becoming, it's going to be, become a thing of its own. And that is when you start using your other light sources, right? How is this rim light going to affect the sides of these planes, right? The sides of this part of the texture. It's gonna look something like this. And then similarly, how is that texture going to look with the reflected light down here? How is that going to look? Well, we'd obviously have to continue making some lines and stuff that we were going to use down here, right? But then we know that, hey, a similar thing is going to happen down here. There's going to be little parts that pick up this reflected light. Okay, but again, you need to do that whole line thing. You need to do all the distortions down here. And that comes by studying, ideally, you wanna have your own texture, your own version of it. If you need metal, look at a spoon. If you need leather, get a bag or your little fake leather thing on your sketchbook. All that stuff really, really helps. All right, oh, whoops. <laughs> but again, all that put together is how you guys make texture. All right, so let me show you how I use this on Lady Maria and I'll save this out for you guys to look at on Patreon. But let's take a look at how that is put into action on Maria. And then I'll show you guys the, show you guys the time lapse. And then, uh, yeah, I think we're gonna end today. It should be good, it should be good. All right, so let's take a look here. Here, first thing, my favorite part is finding the actual layer where I did this. And I 
I'm guessing it's way the heck back here. Ah, perfect. Perfect. Oh, this is great. Okay, guys. So take a look here. This was the original piece of Maria's collar. And you can see how a lot of the lights have already kind of been kind of been laid in there. And that was from the color comp stage. That was where I just kind of started throwing colors in there, but see how messy it is? There's no real, there's sort of a representation of leather there, but now you want to go in and begin refining. And how do we do that? Well, same way that I just showed you guys. I went in there with a layer and look, I smoothed everything out. I said, okay, how matte or glossy is this leather? Well, in this case, I didn't want it to be a super glossy leather. I wanted it to be more matte. So we know from the exercise that that light is going to spill over and it's going to be more diffused and more evenly distributed. There's not going to be a lot of shiny speculars like we see in the blood here, like this gelatinous, it looks like strawberry jam more than blood, but I kind of like that. I kind of like that look. Probably going to carry that to the very end. But see how here it's very diffused. And that's a way of saying, I say that a lot, but that's a way of saying that it's evenly distributed. The gradient is not very sharp. It's a very, very smooth gradient that spans this entire thing. Then look at that. The next thing that I do is I say, okay, well, I don't want to add in all of those tiny little textures. Remember how we did all those little cracks? You could go in there and that would make it look more realistic. But there's another thing that happens within this leather, and that is, say, the embossments or the little designs. And I decided to make it look like a little flower. So I added that on top of it. But then do you see how I make it look like it's 3D as I say, oh, hey, well, there's a little bit of light that's going to get caught on this side of the, uh, of the embossment there. And then these shadows and then like this light is going to affect all these little things, all these little tiny details. OK, um, now let's move on to the next thing, which is the necklace. Now, why does the necklace look shiny? Why does that look more metallic? than the leather. And I'm sure you guys already know the answer. That's because we can see more of the light source and the specular or the, the highlight of, <laughs> of the light can be seen more clearly. See how bright this is and see how concentrated it is versus over here, it's more diffused. Diffused on the leather, concentrated on the metal piece. Yeah, there's still a little bit of diffusion, right? But do you see how the transitions, now this is very important. The transitions are very, very stark and very sharp. So we go from, see look, we go from this gold and then eventually it just drops directly to this dark brown. Now when you do this, this helps to reinforce that this is indeed metal, this is metallic. And look at how shiny this reflected light is, also helping to reinforce that this is a, a reflective metallic surface, right? And I look at it and I know that I could push it better, but overall, I'm pretty happy with it, okay? so. And then same thing over here. See, now we move to the cloth. Do you see any crazy highlights? Do you see white? Do you see anything this bright on the cloth? Not even close. So now we can also say, ah, this is, we're moving back to a cloth surface. All right. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to, I think that's going to end it for now. I think I taught you guys some good stuff for today. So that's an easy way to do textures. Really easy way to do textures. I uh, highly recommend you guys try this stuff out. Always be thinking about, okay, how matte or glossy is this material? And then second step, you then begin adding the distortions. You start adding the things that make it, like the things that you usually think about when you think texture. And that is, say if it's cloth, like all the little stitches they're gonna add in there. The distortions, I like to call them, that are going to appear on top of this. And then make sure you consider how each of those distortions is going to pick up a little bit of light. And once you start doing this, guys, I guarantee you, guarantee you, things are going to start looking really cool. Things are going to start looking really good. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and move into some question catapults. I can't do it with the other arm. Uh, we got some good ones today. Good ones today. All right, so let's go ahead and get to it. First question is coming in from Sengkrit. And Seng is asking, okay, here's the problem. Time to time, I will give up some of my drawing. Whatever the drawing is about 70 to 90% done, almost finished. This happens when I take too long to finish it up and end up, bore, end up bored to draw. Right, like you get tired of it. You get to the point where you're just like, oh, it's so close, but you can't quite finish it. You have another idea in your mind that's like pulling you in this direction, but you can't quite finish the drawing. 
Uh, is it normal for the artist to experience this? And unfortunately, no, I'm sorry, saying you're the only person that has ever dealt with this. No, <laughs> of course not. Now this happens to me all the time. Um, and most of the time it happens when I'm trying to finish a piece and I have another idea or I'm distracted by a video game and I just want to get back to playing that uh, and I eventually end up just ditching a piece. And that's not necessarily bad, but uh, know that it is normal. And the best thing that I have found to combat this is figure out what your general, figure out what your general um, schedule is, or your general habits are for how long you can stick on a piece. Uh, because ideally, you want to be finishing things. You want to be getting to the point where, uh, like, you you learn something every time. And I, and I want you to also be very careful about ditching a piece because you feel like you don't understand how to finish it. Or like you get to a point where you need to render a certain type of material and you're afraid you're gonna fail. Or the composition isn't working out well and you need to fix a bunch of things. I want you to avoid giving up pieces because you realize that you need to fix something or you don't know how to do something. That's a very, very dangerous habit and it will keep you from growing, so watch out for that. Uh, you wanna make sure that you're learning and solving a new problem. Every new picture should be better than the last because you learned something. And well, it doesn't have to be necessarily better than the last because you should be failing a lot too. And you should finish some pictures and be like, man, this really doesn't look good. I really need to get better at doing materials. That's usually the one that I'm saying. I really wanna figure out an easy way to think about running your materials, doing metals, doing leathers, and matte and glossy stuff. And uh, that's why I wanna teach you guys today because this is the stuff that's been going on in my head over the last few months, few months. So yeah, make sure you're learning. Don't give up too early. Next question coming in from Cantrona asking, Jack of all trades, master of none. Been countering the issue where I'm a decent, I'm decent at a lot of things, but do not really stand out at anything. I know that with time and effort, I'd obviously improve uh, the things I focus on, but I was wondering if there are any places for people that have a broader range of abilities, or but aren't exceptional at any of them. Um, yes. If anyone has advice for myself, no, no, is this a common issue? Okay, great question, Cantrona. Be happy to answer that. Uh, the answer is I actually I personally love being a jack of all trades or you want to think of it as like being a master of one thing or being like really good at one thing, right? Uh, not necessarily like a perfect master, but there's always like something there's something good about being very versatile, especially in the marketplace, especially in the industry, because uh, you, there's going to come a time where your boss is going to ask you to do something or help out another team that requires a completely different set of skills, like say you are a promotional illustrator artist, like, like I was working at Riot Games. Uh, but sometimes I would have to help concept artists. And there would be times when the Splash team was having trouble and we'd have to say, hey, concept artist, can you help us render out this image and help us get to this point? You know, and that's a completely different set of skills. They're no longer, like concept artists are so used to like creating something from scratch, uh, c coming up with something brand new, meshing ideas together. And now they have to say, okay, the idea is already done. Let's just make this illustration look as awesome as possible, render out those materials, and you gotta know a little bit of each of those things. Uh, even concept artists, 2D artists, need to sometimes go over and do a little bit of 3D. I never personally did this, but again, it was a really good uh, skill to have, to have a little bit of that knowledge. So I highly recommend that you be versatile. I think it's awesome that you're studying a bunch of different things, Cantrona, you should keep it up. So, but yeah, make sure that you have that specialization. One specialization, but don't be afraid to like branch out a little bit. All righty, people. Next question. Two more. Stumped on how I should be coloring my drawings. Actually, I read this one, and that was one of the biggest reasons why I did the show today. And actually, a little bit more of the Lady Maria stuff. This entire series has been dedicated to you, Doodle Dot. <laughs> and um, yeah, but they're saying that they're having problems with coloring. Now, I think that I touched on this early in the episode when I talked about hue shifting. Hue shifting, I think, is one of the most basic things that you need to understand, uh, and that is thinking about the color of something and then thinking about the light that's affecting it. And most of the time, the light is not a pure white. It's not just going to be a perfect sunlight. Even the sunlight has a little bit of yellow to it. It's a warm light. Um, but also, uh, say the say the character is in shadow, right? But there's still light that's gonna be affecting them. If it's the daytime, what color is that? It's the blue. It's the blue ambient light that's around them. And you need to think, how is that blue light going to affect this red shirt? How, oh, well, it's gonna make it turn a little bit more purple in the lights. Kind of like what we did with, with this here. It might look a little bit more, well, not this, 
not this exaggerated, but mostly thinking about hue shifts. Even in this one up here with the warm light, do you see how we have a hue shift going from, see it's becoming warmer, it's going from purple to red, and then over here it's going purple to blue. That type of stuff I find is very fun. And that just has to do with, um, it's not just color theory because that, that term always used to confuse me. I was like, oh, color theory. That's like uh, mixing a little bit of complementary colors. So there's a lot of blue in this piece. So we need to like add some orange in to like balance it, right? And that's color theory. But I really think that color theory just has to do with thinking about your materials, hue shifting based on the light. And uh, it kind of just tends to take care of itself most of the time. Uh, it can go like in greater detail, but in all honesty, just don't worry about that stuff. You'll cross that bridge when you come to it. Um, a lot of it is like very, it's like stuff that's so, so ingrained in the back of my mind, I don't even think about it anymore, so it's hard for me to put into words. But for now, hue shifts, my friend. Hue shifts and uh, organization really helps. I teach you guys about the line art technique where you put the line art in front, then put the colors behind and then go back to overpaints. I like to do it that way because it's so manageable. It's so broken down into steps and that's what I wanted to do today as well. Thinking about, okay, we don't, we're don't, we no longer painting a texture. We're now thinking about it in a bunch of different steps. And that is, what is the matte or gloss of this material? Then second of all, what is the distortion that happens? What are the lines that are present in that? And then third, how do we light those lines? How do we light those little distortions to create the final texture? Okay, and each with their own, using the same matte or glossy characteristics of the original thing, of the original ball in this case. All right, final question. Final question coming in from Sivnopes. <laughs> They're asking, being exhausted from drawing. I know people say that you have to draw more than six hours every day to become professional. I don't know where you guys get this from. I, I, and, and the number always changes. Do you ever notice that? One person says six hours. One person says 10 hours. The other person says 16 hours. <laughs> it's like, no, you should just be doing, I do agree that you should be thinking about it every day. And ideally you should be drawing every day, but the time, like the exact hour amount is kind of nebulous. Like it doesn't really matter as far as I'm concerned. The important thing is that you're learning something every day. The important thing is that you're moving towards something. You're progressing towards something and not just letting it stagnate or thinking, oh, maybe I don't really wanna be an artist. Maybe I wanna be like a doctor. Maybe I wanna be a lawyer. Like if those questions go through your mind, then you're probably not really meant to be an artist full time because like the fact that you're questioning it means, well, I don't want this, I don't want this to be like super, like denying you your dreams, but um, like you gotta trust in yourself a little bit more. Trust in yourself. Like if you have that feeling that you wanna be an artist, or you wanna do this thing, or you wanna do that, then you really gotta trust in yourself. You gotta trust in that feeling because there's gonna be plenty of people that are not gonna see it for you. There's gonna be plenty of people that tell you that it's dumb and that you shouldn't be doing that. And uh, you gotta do it for yourself. You gotta do it for yourself. Okay, but anyway, going back to this. What am I doing? Uh, what I am doing is basically that. As soon as I'm coming home from school, eat something, learn what is needed, maybe skip something as well, turn on my PC and I begin to draw. Okay, taking breaks, that's really good. Really good, it allows you to absorb and. Uh, really get better at what you're doing uh, as opposed to going in the zone and like kind of like you're going through the motions but your brain isn't really like thinking very well as mine is right now. Uh, <laughs> think that every pencil stroke, how I can make it better. That line right, maybe change some color. Uh, when I'm not drawing, I think about think about drawing how I can get the most out of time. This is really the way to go. I wanna play some Overwatch. <laughs> okay, you wanted to play some games. How much drawing is needed? What is not enough? Uh, every time I finish the pants or a weapon of the character, I feel like I have to take a break because it takes so much power. Okay, yes. Um, this is a perfectly normal thing, especially when you're in the rendering stage. And you do have to take breaks. And there's plenty of time when I'm working on something and I just get exhausted. I get so exhausted. Or I just want to go and play some video games. And that is just something that's going to happen. Taking breaks is very good because when you're looking at something, even for just an hour, you're going to begin seeing it differently than somebody else will uh, for the first time, particularly when you're working on faces. That's why when I was working on this Maria piece, uh, as soon as I finished the face, I finished the face in a night and then I took a break. Like I, I noticed that I was getting to the point where I was getting frustrated. I think particularly with these lips, let me go ahead and kind of turn this on and off. So you can see the refinements that were happening to this face and they're all very, very subtle. They're very subtle. But I was getting to the point where I was getting a little frustrated and that was the point where I realized, okay, you know what? Before I mess this up, 
I am just going to call it a day. Um, or if I needed to continue working, I would have moved on to something else and then call it a day. But uh, you wanna be very careful with faces because you are going to be seeing that face differently than anybody else's after about an hour, okay? So take a break, uh, ideally for a day. Ideally sleep on it, come back to it the next day, uh, and then look at it. And then I came back and looked at this the next day and I was like, oh, well that, that looks fine, everything looks good. I mean, yeah, I'll just kinda clean up these edges here, but overall I think it, it looks good, looks good. There, there was no reason for me to be frustrated. Yet you see if I would've continued with that, I may have changed it from this and uh, kind of pushed it to a whole different direction, may have spent hours on it when originally it was just fine. So uh, yeah, I love that stuff. And getting exhausted, particularly when you're rendering, is a very normal thing. Um, again, my best advice is just move on to a different part of the piece, maybe start a new one, start a new sketch, just, uh, or actually get up and play some video games, just take a break. Um, just be careful about <laughs> getting too zoned into the video games and then like five hours go by and then you, you have to like get back to your painting and you're way behind. You know, so just be careful with that, but obviously that's that all has to do with balance. And I'm sure you guys are all perfectly balanced, disciplined people out there. So you don't have to worry about that, <laughs> unlike me. All righty, people, with all that out of the way, we're gonna go and end today's show. Thank you guys so much for joining me on YouTube. Thumbs up if you like it, thumbs down if you don't. My name is Ken Lafferty. If you would like to dissect and check out this PSD for yourself, and just click up here, take you over to Patreon, where you can download not only this PSD, but all the other PSDs from the past. Yes, that's right. Every single PSD that has been on the show, you can go on and dissect. I am going to have this one up there. You can check out the balls. You can check out Maria. Dissect it for yourself. You have a good time with that. All right, guys. So you guys take care of yourselves. I will see you next, wait, next week. Oh, I do need, I have uh, an awesome update for you guys. Oh yeah, next week, I am going to be gone. So next week, I am actually not going to be here, but I am going to be in Seattle, Washington for Emerald City Comic Con. I can't lift this arm. Emerald, maybe I can do it like this. I'll just do it diagonally. Emerald City Comic Con, where I'm going to be there selling prints, meeting people, shaking your hand, signing stuff. And it'd be really awesome if you guys came out and said hi. So next week, I'm going to be taking off. So I'll see you on, I guess that makes it the 8th. The 8th of March. So until then, you guys take care, stay awesome, and I will see you soon. Come out to the con. Come out.